Hello, everybody. Reporting to you again from the glamour city, Hollywood. So ultimately, you're you're using water more efficiently. And I can touch on a little bit how, how nanobubbles do that, but it's a combination of the improvements in elevated oxygen from air or oxygen combined with the way the bubbles allow that water to uh, uh, move more efficiently through the soil and also improve water quality so you have less disease. So those are some of the ways that nanobubble technology is helping, particularly in Central Valley, California, particularly the topic we were talking about before with drought conditions and need to be able to use water more efficiently. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Nick Diner, CEO of Moliere. Welcome to the show today. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for having us. Appreciate so, it. Nick, you've been in the water business for a very long time, having spent some time at LG, Cam Water Solutions, GE Water and Process Technologies, and, and others. Now, I wonder, you know, what are some of the kind of the biggest innovations that you've seen over the years in the industry? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I've been in the water industry now for almost 17 years. Um, feels like a long time it's gone by very fast uh and i've been privileged to live an extraordinary life I've, I've seen a lot of parts of the world i never thought i would have seen and that's because water is incredibly local um obviously i believe what we do at moliere with man bubble technologies is one of the more interesting innovations in the realm of water particularly for industrial and agricultural purposes but um i think you know there's, there's constant innovation going on in water the challenge is always on the adoption curve and the desire to pay for those innovations, which always typically come out more expensive and takes time to bring down. But, you know, the, uh, previously I was uh, uh, fortunate to work in an early stage company in reverse osmosis membranes, and uh, uh, that's for seawater desalination. And mm -hmm. I truly still believe that is one of the keys to uh, overcoming the challenges associated with climate change and drought. And uh, mm -hmm. I was thinking about this morning the water scarcity challenges due to extraordinary drought in California and the reluctance that California still has to put desalination or implement desalination as a solution. And then you look on the flip side, what Israel, mm -hmm. UAE, Saudi Arabia, and the broader Middle East, Singapore, and other countries have done to in Australia as well to rapidly adopt desalination as a uh, you know, solution to some extent to, to drought and, how the United States needs to start thinking more about that because it was a, or it is an extraordinary innovation. It is a problem solver. Uh, it's not perfect, but it solves the current challenges. And California's got a big one right now. Well, you brought up a few very interesting points. One is the fact that there's a lot of innovations, but sometimes to get it to point of scalable commercialization, it just doesn't quite pass the, the test, litmus test. And maybe the CapEx and OpEx from a pro forma just doesn't quite stand up to it. So a lot of, lot of great scientific projects, but rarely that actually gets scaled on a large, large scale like the ones you've been working on. And then you bring up a really interesting point. I had a big smile on my face because I'm originally from California. I was just in California a few weeks ago. And having driven to Central Valley over by Pismo Beach, it's very clear that they have a serious drought issue. I mean, Sierra Mountain just doesn't have enough snowfall. It, the water from Northern California isn't enough to support Central Valley, let alone Southern California. They definitely need reverse osmosis. And we've seen quite a bit of advancements that's making it cheaper. But yet, you know, unlike, like you said, uh, Israel and some of the other Middle East and Singapore, they, unlike them, as progressive as U.S. is when it comes to adopting technologies, they've been very slow to adopt. And that's going to be highly problematic because you're going to have regions, you know, a big chunk of the U.S. is really agricultural. And it is going to be affected by drought. It's going to be affected by hurricanes, maybe too much water and flooding. That's certainly the case for central um, central um, um, Florida, all the way up to New York um, region. And then you got things like tornadoes and things that's just, you know, wiping farms out and buildings. So, you know, water, water safety is incredibly important. And 
going back to the topic of nanobubble, let's first define what that is. Yeah, and and then I'll, I'll I'd love to tie it to the topic we were just talking about as it relates to drought and the challenges in Central Valley, California, because it's very topical right now for, for our company as well. So so let me tell you about nanobubbles. Um, Moliere manufactures, we call industrial scale nanobubble systems. And these are systems that as water passes through our core technology, we introduce a gas. Most of our customers are using either air or oxygen. And when that gas is introduced into flowing water through our core technology, we produce a bubble that's about 100 nanometers in size. <clears throat> now, most bubbles that we're all accustomed to thinking about, when they form, they start to rise. As they're rising, that gas is dissolving. And for the vast majority of industries that are transferring gas into liquid, the goal is to form a bubble that dissolves in water before it comes to the surface and pops. When a bubble gets below about 200 nanometers, there's two unique aspects of that bubble that occur that separate it from all other bubbles. First and foremost, those bubbles don't have the buoyancy to rise to the surface and pop. So now you have these gas bubbles that are really like particles floating around in, in the, or suspended in the body of water and the liquid. And I'll use water for the sake of conversation, but it could be any liquid. And, and to put that in size, that in context, it's about 2,500 times smaller than a grain of salt. It's incredibly small. It's down at that virus size level. The second thing that happens, that bubble doesn't actually dissolve the way normal bubbles are dissolving as they're rising. You could burst the bubble and the gas is released, but you basically have this now suspended particle made of air or oxygen. So totally natural, totally chemical free, replacing all the other types of harmful chemicals that are often used to make these types of nanomaterials. Suspended in the body of water with these different properties that we then start to think about how we can apply them to various different, often the term is aqueous, but water-based processes, particularly in agriculture and in industry to help those customers, those industries, utilize water more efficiently. So we're trying to increase the value of that water so that they have to use less of it to get what they need from it. So if you're growing crops, for example, whether it's in a greenhouse or an almond field in Central Valley, California, we're trying to help those farmers utilize less water to achieve their output, to get to their harvest or even increase their harvest and yield. So that ultimately you're, you're using water more efficiently. And I can touch on a little bit how how nanobubbles do that, but it's a combination of the improvements in elevated oxygen from air or oxygen combined with the way the bubbles allow that water to uh, uh, move more efficiently through the soil and also improve water quality so you have less disease. So those are some of the ways that nanobubble technology is helping, particularly in Central Valley, California, particularly the topic we were talking about before with drought conditions and need to be able to use water more efficiently, we help farmers do that. You know, I think one of the things uh, that is a clear winner uh, based on what you're describing is really the less use of chemicals. So when it comes to water treatment, especially drinkable water, for instance, you have to, historically, you have to use heavy dose of chemicals. Some of those chemicals can be quite dangerous in large doses. Mm -hmm. um, can you give some examples of the kind of chemicals that typically the water industry uses for different purposes? Yeah, sure. And, and, and I, I will give credit. I mean, the water industry is very mindful of how to ensure that the chemicals that they're using are both doing the job, so creating disinfection and sanit uh, disinfection sanitization, but also are not going to be concentrations that are going to be you know, harmful mm -hmm. to human health. But there are also better ways to do, right? So if you are, uh, uh, it's the thing about drinking water, perhaps we think about more like uh, lakes and ponds or stormwater channels or canals or rivers. Often uh, uh, companies that are managing that body of water will have no choice but to utilize things like algicides, herbicides, and mm -hmm. pesticides and copper because that water is not going to be consumed, but it's also going to take care of you know, odors and uh, uh, harmful algal blooms and other challenges in that body mm -hmm. of water. Those chemicals are actually problematic. And as long as you're not consuming it, you might want to have an issue with human health, but you are going to ultimately leach that water somewhere along the way into you know, into either the soil, into uh, agriculture fields, or potentially into groundwater supplies. Yeah. What we're trying to do is help those those companies look for alternative technology, in this case, using air instead of an algicide, herbicide, pesticide, bleach, or chlorine, to try to accomplish the same outcome, to help them reduce that chemical use. So Jeanette goes to the concept of oxidation and the way nanobubbles oxidize pathogens, algae, and improve the overall aquatic health of a body of water. 
So, so again, uh, this is a fascinating topic. So I'm sure at this point, there's got to be a lot of studies, uh, research that's been done around this. Uh, in terms of this fundamental uh, oxidiz- oxidation and the use of nanobubbles uh, to supersaturate water, this notion, uh, would you say it's a clean or easy replacement for some of these traditional chemicals? Or is it really more of meant to aid it so that you use a lot less of the typical uh, chemicals? It, it can be either or. It always depends. Well, one of the challenges in the water industry is that the, the solution always depends on the quality of water you're starting with and what quality of water you want to achieve. Um, in all cases, our customers are either using less chemicals or eliminating the use of the chemical, but it really depends on what they're trying to accomplish. So one of the projects um, that we worked on last year, a fairly sizable, notable one, was with uh, Los Angeles County Department of Public Works. And there was a stormwater channel called the Dominguez Channel here, actually locally to where we're based in, in Carson, just south of uh, LAX. And, and they had a stormwater channel that was very rapidly depleted of oxygen. So the water went from being an aerobic condition, meaning having mm-hmm. air oxygen, to anaerobic. Now, no longer a presence of dissolved oxygen in that water. And when that happens, bacteria sort of flip. And then all of a sudden, you have anaerobic bacteria that produces uh, uh, hydrogen sulfide compounds, which is that rotten egg smell that we've all smelled on a hot day when you walk past a stagnant sort of puddle of water or, or a, a stormwater uh, 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 drain. And so uh, LA County, to their credit, rather than using harmful chemicals to try to uh, address that solution, they could have done it with bleach and chlorine, but that yeah. water goes into the Pacific. They actually reached out to Moliere to use nanobubble technology to uh, oxidize those harmful uh, odor, sorry, those uh, hydrogen sulfide odor compounds and uh, convert the stormwater channel back to an aerobic condition. And in doing so, they were able to uh, uh, very quickly uh, restore that stormwater channel, eliminate that smell and overcome the challenge they had. So that's, that's one way that completely mm-hmm. chemical free solution. Mm-hmm. So uh, let's, let's stay on the, the topic of uh, drinkable water, right? So, um, so the fact that the, the nano bubble uh, generator is able to create this, this uh, oxidation that dissolves um, or oxidizes metals, removes certain taste and odor compounds. Mm-hmm. How would you describe from a metric, you know, what that means? In other words, using your technology, how much of an improvement can you have? And, and again, recognizing that what to start with and what the end target is different, yeah. but trying to understand really that Delta impact of the nanobubbles. Yeah. So, so it, it really depends on the industry and the application and drinking water, it's not, it's not a market that we're, we are often focused on and from a municipal mm-hmm. perspective. We do a lot in freshwater supplies, but not specifically in drinking water. And, okay. and that's only a function of time to market and when ultimately we, we think about sort of the adoption curve. Obviously, municipal drinking water is very slow to adopt new technology due to the adverse nature of, of trying something new given risk very understandable and very logical. I would tell you in terms of thinking about the value proposition of of nanobubble technology as it relates to chemical savings or improving output in other industries, um, our farmers are typically getting, so if you took uh, agriculture irrigation water, which is a freshwater supply, our farmers, customers in that segment, they're typically getting uh, sort of a payback on using our technology in less than a year. And that's gonna be a function of improving the yield as well as savings either in water or other inputs around chemicals and disinfectants to improve water quality. If you are in the the field of sort of surface water treatment, so reservoirs, canals, lakes, ponds, um, it's going to be a combination of two things. It's going to be the chemical savings, but it's also going to be the improvement in treating that water more sustainably and more responsibly. And there's a growing movement driven by both the end user, the consumer like you and I, but also you know, those companies that manage it because they know it's the right thing to do, to utilize new technology, to accomplish something more responsibly and more sustainably. I think most people recognize that using those you know, algicides, pesticides, herbicide yeah. type of, of products is not something that the broader consumer base wants to see continue when they know there's alternative sol- solutions out there. And then similar in aquaculture, which is another market of ours in salmon farming, it's very similar, you know, paybacks in less than a year, again, on savings as well as an improvement in overall water quality and, and, and uh, 
the in this case the salmon, the fish growth, and fish harvesting. So it really depends on the application. Yeah, yeah. So going back to the agriculture and going back to the example of California specifically, because of water shortages, a lot of these farmers are having to tap into the water tables, and then, of course, the deeper they go. Uh, you're going to have a lot more minerals. So I'm just trying to understand how do these um, nano bubbles help with some of the the bubble, uh, I'm sorry, the mineral aspects, which are not necessarily favorable for all crop, as well as trying to understand scientifically how it helps with the root health, as well as increasing nutrient uptake. Yeah. So, so let me start with the first and we'll talk about root health and, and nutrient uptake afterwards. They're, they're a little bit independent. So, um, when nanobubbles are suspended in water, they're going to reduce the, the surface tension of water, like a wetting agent. And, and typically what companies will use to make water flow more easily uh, is surfactants, right? These are sort of think of like soaps, but don't think of soaps as simply just hand soap, just surfactants that are going to improve uh, uh, the way water flows. And you use that in irrigation sometimes, depending if you can afford it, because they can be expensive, to improve the way water penetrates the soil. Because as soils age, they get more compact. That's why sometimes after you know uh, you irrigate or you, you run your spring, sprinkler, you may say you might see water sitting on top of the soil like a puddle before it actually goes down. It's because the soil is very compact, very hard for the water to penetrate, permeate through it. Eventually, it will, but it takes too much time. What nanobubbles are doing is helping that water permeate the soil more efficiently. And again, going back to that surface tension reduction property, and that has to do with the unique uh, surface charge and electrochemical properties of nanobubbles. So we're helping in, particularly in what some of the research we're seeing out of Central Valley with some very large um, uh, almond and uh, or nut producers, is that as that salt starts to accumulate in the soil, it's very hard to flush that soil out, that salt out. You want to flush that soil out that builds up in the soil because it becomes harder and harder for the crops to grow and at very high salt concentration. So what the nanobubble water is doing is it's penetrating that soil more effectively. So you're using less water more efficiently to flush out all of that salts and you get a much healthier soil. Now going to your second question about sort of root development, root mass, and nutrient uptake, that actually ties in somewhat to nanobubbles, but more importantly, to being able to create a much more oxygenated water. So all, I think the vast majority of crops uh, benefit from having uh, uh, oxygenated water come to the root zone. What Moliere is doing is enabling farmers to utilize oxygen more effectively, to go to even higher oxygen levels, like you said earlier, supersaturating that water with dissolved oxygen. And what we are seeing, or more importantly, our customers are seeing, is that when those when the roots of their plants are exposed to highly oxygenated water, they're becoming much healthier, much larger, much wider. Uh, you see more root sort of the, those tentacles that are out there, and then as a result, with that healthier root mass, not only is that that crop able to you know fend off um, uh, disease or heat stress or or just become more resilient, but it's also consuming nutrients more efficiently. It's got almost more mouths that it can. Uh, eat the nutrients from or convert those nutrients. And as a result, you're able to utilize that water and nutrient base more efficiently and also get more output from the process. You know, you know again, this is, just, uh, you know, being, being very honest about my ignorance is that, you know, my understanding of with uh, plants and certainly, you know, larger bushes and trees is the ability for sequestration of carbon. So under the roots system or under the ground, it's really capturing and holding onto a lot of that carbon aspect. So I'm trying to understand the oxygenation in terms of deliverance of nutrients and so forth. But you know, how does that work in conjunction with carbon capture aspects? Yeah, we've done, we've done very little in specifically looking at whether or not when you're using oxygenated water, do you see changes in sort of the carbon capture and carbon sequestration of the soil. But another area that is interesting, which we haven't done, our customers haven't done too much from a commercialization perspective, but we are looking from a research perspective is what if instead of using oxygen, you're using CO2? And what would that look like yeah. if we were trying to also um, uh, consider that as a gas source in our water? Now, in other industries that we work in, we are looking more at that. So we've done some work in, for example, oil and gas or oil and gas customers mm -hmm. have, uh, which are, are, you, are looking at carbon capture, not only as a means of, of sequestration, but also as a means to um, uh, offset having to drill more oil wells, see if they can actually get more out of the existing assets. And that actually is very ESG, very environmentally focused for now until we obviously look to, to find ways to be more in alternative fuels, clean fuels, et cetera. Um, so we've done a lot of work there. And again, the technology is gas agnostic and liquid agnostic. So it doesn't have to be air oxygen. We have customers who are using our technology to, quote, cap, to sequester CO2 into some sort of aqueous process. 
So as I'm as I'm listening, you know, because there you are, your company is active in so many verticals from aquaculture, wastewater, oil and gas, and many others. Is I'm trying to understand uh, where are the configuration capabilities. So in other words, you know, let's let's say for example, the amount of pressure or a certain amount of you know oxygen per whatever square inch, whatever the metrics may be. How do you fine tune the settings in such a way that you essentially get different outcomes and different products for different applications? Yeah, and so, so that's a great question because it goes to what sort of makes Moliere's core technology so elegant. So, so the patented the the, the core technology that's patented um, has sort of two very important attributes. It's infinitely scalable, which means we can go down to call it below one gallon a minute. And we have some work that we're doing with certain partners in home irrigation to reduce your water footprint in home irrigation um, to thousands of gallons a minute. Our largest systems today are, I think, 4,400 gallons a minute, but we can go even larger. And secondly, we are gas and liquid agnostic, which means we are able to utilize virtually any gas and apply it to virtually any liquid. So most of the time we're working in water is water or wastewater, but we've done sludges, we've done asphaltines, paints, foam, insulation foams, all with the intent of trying to improve those materials. At our core, though, we care about water and how we can help reduce the water footprint and help industries use it more effectively. And so what we're doing is taking this core technology and packaging it in different standard systems and sometimes customized systems, depending on the need for the customer, to be able to give them the uh, ability to apply nanobubble technology to their particular process. So we can provide the pumps, we provide the oxygen concentrators, we even provide ozone if they want to go to a higher level of disinfection or air compressor if they want to use air or nitrogen if they're looking to use nitrogen. And then all the controls and sensors to be able to apply that. And we can do it in a flow rate. So we have very small systems that are doing 25 gallons a minute that are maybe two feet by one foot footprint to very large systems that are you know, in the size of a container that are coming in as a mobile system for a temporary mm -hmm. or long-term solution that we offer either as a service or a sale. And that allows us to be able to apply nanobubble technology because ultimately what their customers want is not the system, they want nanobubbles, but allows us to apply nanobubble technology to their specific process so that they can get the value that they're looking for. Interesting. Uh, for the remaining time that we have, can you share maybe one or two case studies uh, that we, you haven't already discussed where you've applied this technology and the kind of wins or KPIs that they were able to achieve? Yeah. So um, I'll actually start uh, with one of them in salmon farming. So a lot of what we do in, in salmon farming is we're helping customers utilize oxygen more efficiently, improve water quality. That's also going to put, improve fit, fish health, allow them to put more sort of salmon into their particular growing environments called stocking density and ultimately increase the biomass and health of salmon. But we do something actually more interesting in that space, which although not a big market is actually probably one of the most important and impactful things we do as a company. Uh, in Southern Chile, which is one of the uh, uh, sort of epicenters of where salmon has grown, there is a growing movement to figure out how to restore the seafloor, which is being damaged, let's say, by, fish, by the fish waste and fish food that doesn't get converted, falls to the bottom depletes the ocean floor. And uh, we work with companies down there that are utilizing Moliere's nanobubble technology to restore the seabed. And so they're literally pumping oxygen nanobubbles on the seafloor below the sea cages. Mm -hmm. And over a very short period of time, we see dramatic changes in sort of the, the, the biological growth and biological activity it starts to occur uh, below the sea cage. And we really are restoring the seafloor in those mm -hmm. environments. Now, it is uh, uh, driven by regulation. Right. If there was no regulatory push, I'm not so sure if companies would be looking to do this. But the good news is that Chile is pushing for it because it's the right thing to do. And we're develop we're delivering a technology that so far is the only one proven to be able to restore the seafloor in these conditions. And we actually see that as something that has vast applicability for restoring sort of called seafloors, possibly even remediation opportunities on land as well. Uh, that go beyond salmon. It just happens to be that Chile is drive is at the forefront of driving that need and therefore creating the, the, the potential for companies like Moliere and our partners to demonstrate that this is a problem that can be solved with nanobubble technology. I think to give you more of a, an economic example that's specific to, uh, to uh, uh, customers that maybe aren't looking for just an environmental solution to a problem, but are actually looking to you know, boost, ROI, boost uh, uh, output, get a good ROI on the investment, um, I typically almost always turn to to what we're doing in agriculture, right? So, um, uh, and maybe the, the best 
sort of story is what we did that got us into horticulture to begin with, which was a greenhouse in Texas four years ago that fundamentally could not grow in the summertime. The water temperature was too high. When the temperature is too high, the amount of oxygen that it can hold goes down. That's Henry's law. That's physics. Uh, they look to Moliere's technology because they have very shallow water. They're growing hydroponically to uh, see if they could cost effectively, get oxygen back into that high temperature water, 94 degrees Fahrenheit in the heart of summer, and grow. And they saw more than 50% improvements in yield and were able to bring that crop to harvest, which typically in the summertime they cannot because the crop is too small, it's too wilted, it's not healthy, it's not, it's not vibrant. And they saw the complete opposite. Uh, that's what got us into that market. We're now in over 500 different types of uh, growing facilities from a small vertical farm to an outdoor greenhouse, I mean, to a large greenhouse, to an outdoor uh, uh, specialty crop farm, whether it's berries, almonds, cherries, doesn't matter. But it was that project where we saw these dramatic 56 improvement, 56 percent improvement in yield in basil, in arugula, in leafy greens that broke us into that uh, uh, sort of horticulture, controlled environmental agriculture industry, which has been the lion's share, about a third to almost 40 hmm. percent of Moliere's installed base. Well, this is very exciting, and it's been a, a very fascinating conversation and very timely, you know, I think from an ESG sustainability as well as a movement around indoor farming and containerized farming, for instance. So I have been joined by Nick Dine, our CEO of Moliere. I appreciate it. It's been a very vibrant conversation. Thanks, Scott. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.